Oh, hi. Welcome back to Philosophy 115, Critical Thinking. The topic for today is cognitive bias. If you recall from last time, we were talking about several factors that can get in the way of critical thinking. We talked about emotion, anger, fear, that sort of thing. Those are relatively straightforward, both to understand and to, and to experience. Um, less straightforward are these factors that influence you subconsciously and tend to bias your thoughts about some, some argument or some position. <clears throat> and so this is the topic that I want to spend some time discussing. Um, all of these factors are what psychologists call cognitive biases. Okay. Cognitive biases. They're subconscious factors, again, that get involved in belief formation. And the idea, of course, is that uh, a rational thinker ought not to let them get involved in his belief formation. Right? These cognitive biases skew the truth. They cloud thinking rather than, than help it. Okay. Now, <clears throat> of course, these biases are subconscious, as I said, and so um, you might think that there's uh, a limited amount of stuff we can do to try to prevent them from corrupting us, but there are things we can do. And the first thing we can do is to learn about them. And so when we experience them, we may be able to rec recognize them for what they are and stop them in their tracks. The first bias I want to talk about is what's often called by psychologists belief bias. Okay, And the idea here is that uh, many of us are often swayed by some bit of argumentation just on the grounds that we like the conclusion. Maybe we already endorse the conclusion. But of course, accepting uh, the conclusion of an argument is a rather different thing from endorsing the argument as a good piece of reasoning. Okay? <clears throat> After all, if you have a certain view on some interesting and controversial subject matter, well, then you want to have a good reason for having that view, where arguments encapsulate reasons. And so you don't want to endorse just any old argument for that view. You want to endorse the good arguments for that view. Okay. So you don't want to trivialize your position by, by accepting any old argument for the view that you, that you hold. Okay. Um, you know, there are lots of famous philosophical arguments uh, <clears throat> for, say, the existence of God. Okay. This is a major topic in the philosophy of religion. You try to argue that there must be some divine being, omnipotent being, all-loving being. Uh, of course, as history has it, Lots of these arguments were produced by Western philosophers thinking about the Christian God, and so that's the sort of entity they have in mind. But that's then the point, right? Why are all there are all these different arguments for the existence of God? Well, you might as well ask why not. Ha why do you have any at all? Okay, because after all, there's a difference between believing in God and feeling as though, and maybe being right about, the idea that you've got a good reason for believing in God. Okay. <clears throat> so, when a philosopher examines these classical arguments for the existence of God, the fact that the existence of God is their conclusion is really of less weight than how the argument goes the premises used to get to that conclusion are really where the action is. Okay? It's very common nowadays uh, to try to come up with very quick and easy arguments for some controversial position. Okay? And if you're susceptible to the belief bias, you may endorse these arguments without looking at the argument much at all, but endorsing it only because you already accept the conclusion of the argument. So, that's a thing to be avoided. Okay, that's the belief bias.
The second bias I want to talk about is what's called the false consensus effect. And the idea here is that many of us, again subconsciously, again irrationally, or perhaps subrationally, are often inclined to assume that other people in the room, other people around you, believe the same way that you do. Okay. That is, there's an assumption of a consensus, but the assumption is false, often. Hence, false consensus effect. Okay. Examples of this are legion. You can uh, go out in the world and experience this probably almost any day that you want to. Uh, it happens also in philosophy departments. Paul Teller once told me a story about a class he was teaching. Uh, he was teaching a class in the philosophy of physics, I believe it was. And the question came up about the truth of a doctrine called physicalism, okay, which is a thesis that, uh, in effect, I think they were calling it reductionism, okay, a thesis to the effect that really everything can be explained in terms of fundamental physics, right? That fundamental physics is really the language of the universe, and it is really ultimately the language that can be used to describe and capture all of the universal's phenomena. Okay. So uh, <coughs> physics doesn't just describe uh, ultimately atoms and energy and, and quarks, but also, ultimately, chemical properties, biological properties, economical properties, perhaps. The thesis is that physics teaches us that all there really is is just atoms and void and, and energy, force fields, and that sort of thing. And so any sort of entity in the world must be made up out of that stuff. Okay? Uh, an interesting chemical compound is really just a collection of atoms and forces and energy fields and that sort of thing. Okay? Moreover, animals and plants and human beings and ecosystems and maybe economical infrastructures and everything in the world, here's the thesis of reductionism, can be described ultimately in terms of fundamental bits of matter and motion. And so Teller is telling me the story about this question that he puts before his class, expecting there to be a great deal of debate on the topic. It's, it's very much a live issue. Uh, <clears throat> the old view, the, the sort of 100 years ago, was far more popular to believe that in this kind of reductionism, that, that physics really was the ultimate science, that biology was really just applied chemistry, which was just applied physics, and so on. Um, but lately the view has come to be challenged, and I think rather successfully. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the, the more current ideas in vogue are that certain kinds of entities resist explanation at the level of physical uh, subatomic particles and the like. Okay. In any event, uh, Teller was expecting there to be a good debate on this topic. That's why he raised it, of course. And to his amazement, no one really had anything to say. No one was volunteering to speak in defense of physicalism or against it. And Teller was having a hard time understanding how this could be. And uh, certainly, you've probably all been in classes that were that were quiet. But this was this was extreme. Okay. And so finally, Teller asked someone, "Well, why why is there no discussion about this?" Uh, and it turned out that. Half of the room were thinking that the thesis of physicalism, reductionism, was obviously true, and the other half were thinking that it was obviously false. Okay? That's an illustration of the false consensus effect. You form some belief about some matter based on some evidence or some argument or some hearsay or whatever, and we have this common tendency to think that everyone will be affected by that in the very same way. I, here I am thinking that physicalism is clearly false. Surely my fellow students in the room must think that as well, if they're, if they're, whatever, if they're like me, if they're 
good, clear-thinking people. Right? And of course, here I am shown to be wrong. There are lots of good, clear-thinking people with quite the opposite ideas. Okay? And again, that just shows you that the emphasis is really not so much for in any philosophy class, really, on what you believe, but on how you believe it. How do you get to that conclusion? Why do you believe that? What is your reason? What is your argument? Okay. And the false consensus effect is really just uh, <clears throat> a similar illustration of this I, I, mistake to highlight the, uh, the position itself rather than the argument for it. The third cognitive bias I want to talk about is called the bandwagon effect. Um, <clears throat> and this one may be familiar to you. Uh, the basic idea is that many of us have this, again, irrational, subconscious tendency to go along with the crowd, okay? to believe as do the others around us, even though, of course, how my neighbors believe uh, really is quite irrelevant to how I ought to believe, because his evidence is not mine, um, his perception of the world is not mine, etc. And I think to illustrate this phenomenon, this bias, it's helpful to think about Rorschach tests. Okay? Rorschach tests are these tests that psychologists and psychoanalysts often give to patients. <coughs> and um, how it works is you hold up an ink blot, and there's a sort of smear of ink on a piece of paper, some, some shape on the page, and the psychologist asks the patient, tell me what this is, what do you see? Okay. And of course often these images are, are not really made to look like anything in particular, They're, they have certain curves and lines that are suggestive of certain, certain objects maybe, but nothing clear. The idea being, of course, that uh, what someone sees in the blot will reveal something about his inner states, okay? his inner states of mind. Um, but I think in, in illustrating the bandwagon effect, right, it will be helpful to think now about what would happen if the psychologist were running this kind of Rorschach test with multiple patients at the same time. Okay? What would probably happen is this. The psychologist would hold the ink blot. He'd say, what do you see here? Someone would raise his hand and say, oh, I don't know, pick something. Here. I see an automobile. Okay. And very likely, other people in the room would start claiming sincerely that they saw an automobile in the picture too. Okay. Why? Well, because we have this bandwagon effect, this tendency to go along with the crowd, to believe as do those around us. Uh, a similar example is, um, and maybe in some ways better, since it has often a more public forum, are these so-called magic eye 3D images in books and pages and other, other representations. I'm sure you've all seen these. Uh, <coughs> they're drawings that look on the surface like just sort of some kind of symmetrical pattern, but if you can look at the image in the right sort of way, I think you have to kind of try to focus on a point beyond the image or maybe in front of the image and let your eyes relax. And when you do that, these images are designed in such a way that some three-dimensional image is supposed to pop up out of the book, out of the page. Okay. <clears throat> and I think this false consensus, sorry, bandwagon effect literally happens with these images. Right? Someone will have one of those, those 3D magic eye images and say, aha, I see the boat or the book or whatever it's supposed to be. And very often he'll show it to his friends and say, look, here it is, I, do you see the book? And then the friends will say, oh yes, of course, I see it too. Right? And they may even actually believe what they're saying. Right? But I think in many cases this is just yet another illustration of, of the bandwagon effect. Right? To try to, um, this tendency to believe how others around you believe. The fourth cognitive bias I want to talk about is called the in-group bias. This one is also pretty straightforward and probably pretty common and familiar to you. 
<clears throat> and the basic idea here is that we have a tendency to favor the people we judge to be in our group as opposed to the people we judge to be outside of our group. Okay, this is, in many ways, the essence of politics. Right? Categorizing people, categorizing opinions, separating them in particular into those who are with me and those who are against me, those who are like me and those who are unlike me, right? those who are in my group and those who are not in my group. Um, pay special attention to the, the PowerPoint slides here. There's a, uh, a, a very short story by Franz Kafka in there that illustrates this kind of in-group bias. Okay, it's something like a kind of um, xenophobia or paranoia. Right? That because someone is uh, not in my group, because he doesn't look like me, or he has a different sort of religion, or he has a different sort of belief, or whatever... I, again, this is all subconscious, will pay less attention to him. I will give less merit to his views. That sort of thing. <clears throat> we have this tendency to favor people that we judge to be inside our group, to disfavor people that we judge to be outside our group. Okay. Fifth the phenomenon that psychologists call obedience to authority. Okay. We all have a tendency, most of us, most of us have a tendency, to be obedient to authority. That is, to be inclined to favor the opinions or views or commands of someone whom we judge to be in authority, as opposed to someone who we judge to have no authority. Okay. Now, there's a very notorious, famous example of this effect, um, which was done by a, a psychologist called Milgram back in the 70s at, at Stanford University. It was a very famous experiment. And Milgram had a very uh, uh, interesting idea for... for um, trying to show this, this phenomenon of obedience to authority. Ultimately, he was interested in um, how in the world something like the Holocaust could have happened, how it could have been that so many German citizens were obedient to the German authorities. How could it have happened that there was this mass killing machine in Germany, killing Jews and gypsies and homosexuals and, and all these other so-called undesirables? And so Milgram set about his experiment in the following way. He divided his volunteers, um, well, yes, he divided his volunteers into two groups. Some were going to play the part of uh, the, this uh, apparent medical authority, and others were going to play the part of, uh, of experimenters. And so the, the, the way the experiment ran was like this. <clears throat> uh, a test subject would walk into a room and there would be this other um, experimenter there, this guy in a sort of white lab coat. And the guy in the white lab coat would offer the test subject a chair and the guy in the white lab coat would explain what was going on, that in particular that there was a person on the other side of the wall and that he was hooked up to this electrical device. And the guy in the white lab coat would proceed to, to ask the test subject to electrocute the person on the other side of the wall. Okay. Now, in fact, there wasn't any real electrocution going on. There was just a, a, a couple of switches in the room, not hooked up to anything, but they would maybe make a nice uh, appropriate buzz or something. And so the um, test subjects would throw the switch, and when they did, they would hear a little yelp from someone on the other side of the wall. Okay, now the yelp um, <clears throat> was not, again, not in response to any actual electrocution or pain or anything like that. It was all just part of the experiment. And so the test subject would think he was giving a small shock to someone on the other side of the wall, 
And then, here came the real genius of the, of the experiment. The guy in the white lab coat would ask the test subject to increase the voltage to shock the person again. Okay. And of course, what Milgram showed, what the results of the experiment were, were that most people were indeed willing to do this. Okay. They would crank up the voltage, shock the person again, the yelps would grow louder, say, please stop shocking me, maybe, that sort of thing. But because of the authorial air of the guy in the lab coat, many people were inclined to be obedient to him. Um, there's a kind of uh, in, inclination to trust people who seem to be in authority. Right? That's what the experiment was about. Um, and I think probably Milgram went some way toward explaining how such a thing as the Holocaust could have arisen right? along these lines. You get someone who looks like an authority, and of course all it takes is someone who looks like an authority. It just takes a lab coat, a person with a clipboard, a person with a very uh, intellectual air about him. That's often all it takes to get someone to obey that very authoritative looking person. And of course, again, this is all a mistake. This is all bad when it comes to trying to reason critically. Um, the mere fact that someone looks like an authority is, of course, hardly any reason to trust in him, to follow his commands, to believe what he believes. Right. Now, <clears throat> we have to be careful here because there's a related um, a strategy of, of belief formation that's actually good, namely appealing to authorities, appealing to people who really are experts in the relevant subject. But that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is not appealing to actual experts, but merely being suckered in by people who act like they're experts, who seem to be authorities. Okay? And that, surely, is a mistake. That is falling prey to bias. And finally, I want to mention the overconfidence effect. Okay? The overconfidence effect is... Uh, a kind of bias that exhibits itself in many people and it's what the name suggests many people have the illusion that they're better than average okay. you can um, you know take a poll of people ask them if they think they're an average driver or below average or better than average driver and most of the people in the room will write better than average okay. and of course that can't really be right since that's not in the nature of an average, to be below most people. Right? Um, you know, I think American Idol exhibits this this bias too, right? Um, many of the contestants go on to uh, the audition room full of confidence, convinced that they're really excellent singers, convinced that they're going to make it into the show, into Hollywood. And then, of course, many of them do not. Many of them have their dreams dashed by the, by the evil judges. Right? And I think probably what's going on there is that they're under the spell of the overconfidence effect. Okay? This, again, unconscious, subconscious, irrational, subrational temptation that many of us have to believe that we're better than the average person. Okay, okay that's the overconfidence effect. And that's the final bias that I want to talk about today. Now, with all these threats of, of bad thinking, with all these biases that can get in the way, and especially because they're subconscious and so hard to, hard to notice sometimes, it can be difficult to know how to proceed. But the best defense is to think critically. Now, <clears throat> this isn't, again, always something we can do. Sometimes it's more expedient or easier or faster to act only on intuition, not to take a moment to stop and think. Um, and sometimes that's the appropriate thing to do, but other times it'll cost you. Okay? If you are able to stop and slow down and not jump to conclusions, because that's really what these biases do, is they help you to jump to conclusions. 
That is, jump over the argumentation to get to the conclusion. Right? You jump ahead to the conclusion without worrying about how you get there in the first place. But again, how we get there in the first place, that's what philosophy is all about. That's what clear thinking is all about. Okay. Well, uh, at this point I invite you all to go watch the film, Twelve Angry Men. Uh, and keep in mind as you watch these different biases. And I think you'll see them pop up as you watch the film. Okay, that's it for now. See you next time.